I want to go back to an outline I composed years ago in a sermon that I did entitled, On Being a Christian. I preached this sermon in June of 1991, so that would have been hmm, over 31 years ago, probably about 31 and a half years ago. Some of you weren't even born yet, so you wouldn't remember it. Some of you that were here then, I probably don't remember it. Just to make it distinct from the one I did then, I'm just going to title it, Being a Christian. Being a Christian. Now, before I go into this, the word Christian is used very loosely in the world. There are millions of people throughout this earth that make the claim to be a Christian. They would say they are a Christian. I'm sure our president would say he is a Christian, as an example. So, it's used very loosely, whereas the Bible uses it in a very narrow and restricted sense, as I will point out to you. Now, as a minister of the gospel, who is called to preach the word, which is truth, I have to tell you, biblically, by the word of God, what a Christian is. And that may be troubling for some people because of other people that they see that profess to be Christians and are good people and appear to be trying to serve God to the limits of their light. And yet, if you put them under the strict searchlight of the Bible, they really don't qualify to be a Christian as the Bible defines it. And as a minister, like I say, I have to preach the truth. I am called as a pastor in the very passage, part of my work that, that our brother read this morning, later on in the passage when he talks about the different spiritual gifts and he mentions pastor and teacher. One of the things that I'm commanded to do in Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm just going to read it to you, verses, verse 14. I'm supposed to be perfecting the saints for the work of the ministry, edifying the body of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love. It is my responsibility to teach you in such a way as to save you from error and deception. And in order to do that, I must preach the truth. At least what I believe is the truth and understand to be the truth. I don't see that I have a choice. And in order for me to save you from deception, I need to know what the truth is and I need to preach it as such. I don't have a choice. And I can't go through this book and pick and choose pieces and parts and overlook others because I want to broaden the umbrella to be more inclusive of those who claim to be Christians, to be able to say that really there are more people that are Christians than just the way the Bible would narrowly define it. I don't want to be guilty of being like those apostate priests in Malachi 2.7, of which it is said that they were partial in God's law, pick and choose what they want, overlook what they don't. And there is nothing in the law of God, no matter how minor on the surface it may seem to be, that I have license to say, well, we can just overlook this. This doesn't make a difference. Our blessed Lord himself said in Matthew 5, 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So, I don't want to fall under a judgment because I take something God says and said, oh, well, we won't bother about that. We don't think that's important. When the Lord attaches significance even to what might on for, or, or what actually are lesser things and not as weighty as other things. I can't be partial in the law of God. So I have to just lay the line like the Bible does it with the understanding that every single one of us 
is responsible before God to obey the truth as far as you know it. I mean, if you don't know it, obviously you don't know it. How do you obey something you don't know? But we are responsible as far as we know to be obedient to the truth. Uh, Jesus Christ taught this plainly in Luke chapter 12 and verses 47 and 48. When he said, that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. If you know there's something you ought to do and you refuse to do it, God's going to deal more severely with you. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of strife shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required, and to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. You see, even the people that don't know and do things worthy of stripes, they're not going to beaten with as, be beaten with as many as the one that knows better, but they're still going to get a little a, a, a beating. And if you stop and think about it, it makes perfect sense. Because all of us in our past, when we were ignorant of things we know better now, suffered for that ignorance. We suffered for that ignorance. Now, all of that said, and I will get into this and show you how the Bible defines a Christian. And again, it's not anywhere near so broad as people use the term nowadays. And before I get there, let me say this, and I think this is so important. In the religious world, people generally equate being a child of God with being a Christian. That's wrong. Christianity refers to a certain mode of conduct and belief. Every true Christian, I'll put it to you like this, every true Christian is a child of God, but not every child of God is a true Christian. God has children out there that don't even know about Jesus Christ, haven't even heard the gospel yet. They're children of God, but they're not Christians. Now, having said that, I want to give you a very important point, an example, that I want you to remember. There was a man in the book of Acts by the name of Cornelius that was not a Christian. He did not know the gospel. And it is said of him in Acts chapter 10 and verse 2 that he was a devout man. He was a very sincere religious man. And one that feared God so far as he understood God with all his house and which gave much alms to the people. He was kind to the unfortunate and to the poor, very generous, and prayed to God always. Now, this man was a very sincerely religious man. And the Holy Spirit's telling us that. He was doing the best he could with what he knew. And furthermore, he was an eternally saved child of God at this time, and this manner of life evidenced that. In fact, God calls Peter to go preach to this man. And he tells this man, you need to send to Joppa for one Peter and come and he'll tell you what you need to do. There were obviously things that were missing in this devout man's life that he needed to do that were acceptable to God that he didn't know. And so God in his providence was arranging for him to meet the preacher that would tell him what he needed to know, namely the gospel of Jesus Christ and its commandments, so that he might become a Christian. But before Peter ever preached to him, God made it very plain to Peter that this man was already cleansed. Jesus had died for him. His sins had all been taken away and cleansed in the blood of Christ. And when Peter arrived there to preach to him, this is the first thing he said in Acts 10.34. And this is what I would say about these people out there that are doing the best they can with what they know sincerely to serve God to the limits of their light, but yet do not meet the biblical qualifications of a Christian. I would say of them the same thing that Peter is going to say of Cornelius. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, you see, being a Jew, he had a very narrow view 
and it needed to be broadened out to understand that God had his children elsewhere than just in the Jewish nation. But in every nation, he that feareth him, and Cornelius did, and worketh righteousness, and Cornelius did, and look at what it says, is accepted with him. He didn't work righteousness to be accepted, you see. His working righteousness evidenced that he was accepted. He that worketh righteousness is accepted. As far as the person of Cornelius, Christ died for him, his sins were forgiven, his person was accepted. According to the words of Ephesians 1, 6, he hath made us accepted in the Beloved. But while his person was accepted in Jesus Christ, all of his conduct was not acceptable. There were things missing that would have been acceptable and pleasing to God that he needed to learn. There were things that are acceptable to God he needed yet to learn, to believe, and to practice. And that's where the gospel preacher came in. To teach him about the one that saved him, Jesus Christ. He was ignorant of the gospel and what Jesus Christ accomplished. And then to call him to obedience to Jesus Christ, which he did in baptism. And at that point, that is when this good man became, this devout man became a Christian by Bible definition. And so I can tell you that there are plenty of people out there in the world that are devout and are serving God to the limit of the light and knowledge they have. They're children of God, but that does not automatically mean that they are Christians. So we need to be very careful that we use the word biblically. And I'm going to talk to you today on how a child of God becomes a Christian. But I want to tell you something. You may be a Christian today, and tomorrow you may not be. Christianity has to do with answering the call of Christ to discipleship. And so it is possible for a person that's a Christian to so conduct themselves that even though they may call themselves that, they are no longer that. But God has a remedy whereby they can be restored and become that again. There is a challenge, as I shall show you, to every one of us to be a Christian every day of our life. And so, I don't, it's not, like I've told you, it's not my job to go out there and say who's a child of God and who isn't. That's God's call. And when it comes to who's a Christian and who isn't, my responsibility is to be one myself. I don't have to worry about all the other people out there unless they come to me and they want me to teach them and show them the way of the Lord more perfectly, then I'll look at their life, I'll look at their belief, I'll see where it's not measuring up to this, and I'll try to bring them up to that if God so blesses. That's my responsibility. That's what I'm called to do. But there's an interesting verse that we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I think we all need to focus on. In 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 12, Paul is writing to the local church at Corinth, and he said, what have I to do to judge them also that are without? All these people that aren't part of the church. What do I have to do to judge them also that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? Within here, within this body, we have a responsibility to judge who is and who isn't a Christian because they're the only kind of people we're supposed to be taking communion with. But as far as outside the church, what do I have to do to judge them? Let God deal with them. And furthermore, I want to say this. God is sovereign. God can do whatever God wants to do and use whomever God wants to use. If there are some people out there that do not fit the strict biblical definition of a Christian that God wants to use in some way to promote his truth or to bring glory to his name, that's his business. But that's not a rule for me to walk by. My rule are the commandments he has given me in this book. To follow them to the extent that I know and understand them. With this caveat, I do not do so perfectly. I would not be a bit surprised 
to discover on the day of judgment, in fact, I rather expect to discover on the day of judgment, that we too, that I too, have had my blind spots, my imperfections, things that I didn't quite get or have together, just like everybody else, and God will deal with me thusly. But still, it's my responsibility, with the understanding that I'm not perfect, to try to follow the pattern as closely and perfectly as I possibly can. I do not see that the Bible gives me an out on that one, and it doesn't give you one either. No out on that one, people. But, if I see some group of people over here, and it looks like God might be using them, and yet they don't fit the biblical definition of a Christian, that doesn't mean that I now have to go back to the drawing board and redefine what a Christian is to make allowance for this thing. Because I don't necessarily know what God might be doing with those people. I don't know their hearts. I'll let God judge that. If God wants, I'll give you an example. In the Bible, God used a hireling prophet, a guy that was in it for the money, to issue some of the most beautiful prophecies of the coming of the Messiah as anybody has ever uttered. God used him to do that, a hireling prophet. But does that mean I should become like that just because God used him? God used an apostate high priest, Caiaphas, to issue a beautiful prophecy concerning Jesus Christ. Does that mean that then it'll be okay for me to become some apostate preacher because God used one? If God wants to use a Muslim sheikh to convert a Hindu to monotheism, to the belief in only one God, that's fine. He can do that. But that doesn't mean that it'd be okay for me to be a Muslim. If God wants to use a Catholic priest to convert a Muslim to the doctrine of the Trinity, that's fine. But that doesn't justify me becoming a Catholic. You see where I'm going? So God can do what God wants to because God is sovereign. But that's not a rule for me to walk by. I have my marching orders and by them I must march. I don't see that I have another choice. And whatever is outside and beyond that is God's to deal with. I'm not God. I don't have the command. I don't have the control of that. That is one thing that ever since our first parents drank the poison, ye shall be as gods. If we would all be honest, we have a problem with that. We have a problem with that. One of my favorite lines in a movie is in the one on the movie Rudy, based on a true story about a fellow with a slight frame that wanted to be a football player, but just wasn't big enough. And he was asking the priest why it was that God didn't let him be big enough and strong enough to play football. And I love the answer the priest gave him. He said, there are two incontrovertible things I have learned in my life. Number one, there is a God. Number two, I am not he. I love that. That's a tough le That's a harder lesson learned than maybe we want to admit. So with all of that out in front of us, let's look at exactly what a Christian is. The term only occurs three times in your Bible, twice in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 11 and Acts chapter 26, and one time in 1 Peter chapter 4. And in Acts 11, 26, we read... In verse 26, this is very tight, very clear, very concise. And when he, that is Barnabas, had found him, that Saul, later Paul, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. This is a local church at Antioch made up of baptized believers in Jesus Christ. That's what a church is made out of. That's, that's a fundamental tenet of the Baptist religion, is the church is made up of baptized believers. That's how you become part of the church, by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and being baptized in his name. And it's an assembly. People come together as we do this day. This is exactly what Paul and Barnabas were doing for one year with this local church at Antioch. Uh, they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And here it is. Here's the definition strictly given. 
and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Referring to these disciples gathered in that church for the first time, they gained the name Christian. So clearly, a Christian is a disciple of Jesus Christ. And a disciple is one who follows or attends upon another for the purpose of learning from him. It is a pupil or a scholar. So discipleship, Christian discipleship, obviously consists of our being followers of Jesus Christ and in the process, learning of him. It is an educational process. As we follow, we learn. He's the master, we're the scholars. We go, there was, a little, there was a little song they used to sing in one of the hymnals down south. I am a little scholar, I daily go to school. Talking about being in the school of Jesus Christ and learning from him. And further verses will bring this out. So if you look strictly at the Bible definition, let me couple that verse in Acts 11 26 with another found in John chapter 4 and verse 2 to let you know what a disciple is. In John chapter 4 and verse 1, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John this is how you become, this is how you are made a Christian. This is what goes into the making of a Christian. Being a Christian. Jesus made and baptized. Now I want you to notice carefully what it said. Because many people believe that as long as you believe in Jesus, whether you're baptized or not, you're a Christian. This is commonly believed. But again, remember, many people equate Christian with being a child of God. And many people believe that to become a child of God, you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you become a child of God and thus become a Christian. They've got those things mixed up. But I want you to notice, it did not say Jesus made disciples and baptized. It said he made and baptized disciples. And so a necessary part of being made a disciple, becoming a disciple, or a Christian, because it's the disciples that are called Christians. Do you get that? Is that one must be baptized. And of course that argues for a proper baptism, because not everything that calls itself baptism is. A true New Testament baptism must be by immersion. It must be performed by a proper authority, to baptize, which is an ordained minister of the gospel, resulting in membership in a true New Testament church. And the person must believe certain things to qualify as a believer to be baptized. These are the essentials for a valid baptism. So that we can say that a Christian is a validly baptized, baptized according to the standard of the New Testament, that's where a person becomes a Christian. And then that just gets him started. That constitutes him officially a Christian. But now the challenge is to continue to be one. You see. It is in its essence answering the call of discipleship. As our Lord said in Luke chapter 14 and verse 27. Remember, a Christian is one who follows upon another. He's following somebody. And in this case, it's following Jesus Christ. In Luke 14, 27, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And we know that bearing the cross is the whole issue of self-denial. Let a man deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. If he would be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that process starts at baptism. And as I point out to you what is necessary to become a disciple. You will see 
that element of self-denial come into the picture. You'll see where that's an integral part of following Christ, taking up our cross. But where does it start? Where do we start being a Christian? It starts with our baptism. That's when you, by biblical definition, became a Christian. You were made a disciple. Now the challenge is to keep up with where you started. To go on from where you started. And that's a daily challenge for all of us. In Luke chapter 9, 23, the blessed Lord will tell us this. If any man will come after me, to come after Jesus is to have him coming in front of me. And I'm following. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. And I'll point this out momentarily as we look into what is tied into a baptism. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This thing of being a Christian isn't something that just we get baptized and that's it. We're a Christian going forward. Nothing else necessary. Oh no. It starts us on the Christian's walk. The Christian's path. And each day is a challenge for all of us to be a Christian. And let's all admit it, okay? We aren't always a Christian, are we? We don't always act like a Christian. We don't always think like a Christian. And this is why we have to keep coming back and doing what we did when we became a Christian. And that is repent of our sins, ask God to forgive us, clean us up and get us back on the path of being a Christian. And then to couple this with John 8 to round it out, what is involved in discipleship, and to show that this is a process. This is a way of life. You see, becoming a child of God is something God does instantaneously, once for all, forever. Christian, being a Christian is a different thing. It's not something we do to become a child of God. It is something that we do as a child of God, to have the blessed assurance we are the children of God. Now, I hope you understand what I mean by that. And so in John 8, our blessed Lord said in verses 31 and 32, Jesus said to the Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, you started with it, you believe what I'm telling you, now you got to stay coarse. Continue in my word, Believe what I'm telling you. Do what I'm telling you. Then are you my disciples indeed. And notice the learning process that comes with it. And ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Now, the first thing in talking about how do we become a Christian that I want to drive home to you is that in reality, it is a simple thing to become a Christian. In Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16, our Lord put it this way. They brought young children to him, that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased, and said unto them, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. You don't have to be some towering intellect. You don't have to have reached full adult age to be able to qualify to be a Christian. Obviously, children do not have the intellectual capacity of older people. But when a child has enough intellectual capacity to understand what he needs to believe to be a Christian, he may be a Christian. It is relatively simple. Matthew chapter 11 makes this very clear. Our blessed Lord tells us in verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. A yoke is, when you yoke up a, a pair of oxen, you're getting them ready for service. 
ready to put them to work. That's why you put the yoke on them. And he says, take my yoke. So when you take the yoke of Jesus to become his servant, he's in there with you. You're on one side of it and he's on the other side. I'll give you a verse later about that. He helps you to bear it because he bears it with you. It's his yoke. He's on one side, you're on the other. And I can assure you he's bearing the greatest part of the weight. But notice what happens when you do that and learn of me. It is an educational process. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. And this is what I am after. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It's not hard to become a Christian. It is simple. So simple that Isaiah will put it to us this way. In Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 8. Isaiah 35, 8. And highway shall be there and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring man. You know what a wayfaring man is? It's a man on a journey. That's life in this world. We're on a journey, and we have a destination, and it's one of two, heaven or hell. Which road are you on? But we're wayfaring men. Jim wrote a poem. And Jared Laba has composed music for the poem. Jim played it for me this week. It's beautiful, Jared. The music you composed to his poem. And his poem is Life is a Journey. And that's true. And I'm talking to you today about how to get started on the right way in this journey. How to select the right path. The path that will give you assurance as you move along it that the end of that path is everlasting life. But he says of this path, it is for the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. One need not be a great intellect to be a Christian. One might be very simple, but one can still be a Christian. I have known of people that were mentally retarded and yet had enough knowledge that they could become and be a Christian. My mind goes back to a couple of people that I remember were just such as I'm describing to you now. Now, so having established what a Christian is, a baptized believer and member of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was those assembled in Antioch, that those members of that church, those disciples that were called Christians first. And so now we look at what one must do to become a Christian. Obviously, to be baptized. But there are two requirements for baptism. You must meet these two requirements to be properly baptized and thus to truly become a Christian. And that is you must repent of your sins and you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to break that down, what you need to believe in order to become a Christian. I'll deal with that first, then we'll flip back and take a look at the repentance part of it. All right, first of all, we come to Acts chapter 8. The things you need to believe to become a Christian. In Acts chapter 8, 36 through 40, 38, and as they went on their way, this is Philip and the eunuch. The eunuch had been reading the prophecy of Isaiah 53, didn't understand what he was reading, and Philip began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And we read in verse 36, as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So one must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And let me give you three other passages, and then we'll sum it up. Because these sum up what one must believe to become a Christian. 
Nobody has any business being baptized until they are old enough and able to understand these things I'm going to point out to you that need to be believed in order to become a Christian. In Acts chapter 8, I've already read that. Then we're going to go to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. And he saith unto them, and there will be some things that will pop up in some of these verses that I will not expound today. I just don't have time. It'll take me too far afield from my subject, and I want to keep it more contained. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 15, our Savior said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth, the implication being obviously believing the gospel. Not just believing anything, but believing the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So a person needs to believe the gospel in order to qualify to be baptized. That is a strong tenet of Baptist religion. Believers baptism. This is why we do not baptize babies. Do not accept the baptism of babies. I don't care by what mode it may have been administered. That baby was not old enough to be believed the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And then, uh, and furthermore, I will say this. If you are taught the gospel and you hear the command to believe and be baptized and you refuse to be baptized, how can you possibly walk away and say, but I still believe the gospel? I still believe that Jesus is Lord, which means He has the right to tell me what to do, and yet I refuse to do it. The Son of God said in Luke 6, 46, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? It's an empty profession. In fact, I'll say this. If you dare call Him Lord, and if you say you know Him, and you are a Christian, and yet you refuse to do what He tells you to do, I tell you on the authority of the Word of God, you are a liar. Because we read in 1 John chapter 2, He that saith he knoweth Him, and keepeth not His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And let me give you the verse in case you think I made that up. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 4. It's as plain, as plain, as plain can be. If you want to be a real Christian, a true Christian, and not some fake, then you do what Jesus tells you to do. It's as simple as that. And then come to 1 Corinthians 15, and we look at verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, the gospel. He's going to tell us what that gospel is that we need to believe to be properly baptized. I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now here it is. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto the present, but some are fallen asleep, meaning some had already died. So the gospel message summed up is this. It was preached in the prophets that a Messiah would come and would suffer and die for sins. Jesus is that one. He was buried, the scriptures taught it would be. And he would rise again the third day, the scriptures taught that it would be. And these historical facts are validated by what eyewitness testimony. That's the gospel. Jesus was sent. He, he was the, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the one God sent. To save by means of his death, burial, and resurrection. And it's absolutely essential that you believe he is resurrected from the dead. 
that he is the Lord, the Christ, risen from the dead. When you go through the book of Acts, and you look at the gospel preachers, they preach the gospel very differently than a lot of preachers do now. Most preachers go around the world and they tell people this. If you want to go to heaven when you die, you must believe that Christ is your personal Savior. That's the condition. You've heard that. You must receive Christ as your personal Savior if you want to go to heaven. I want to show you the flaw in that. What is the Savior? It's somebody that saves. If Jesus hasn't saved you, then is he your Savior? No. He's only your Savior if he saves you. So here they go to this person that they think is a lost and ruined, hell-bound, unsaved sinner. And they tell him, now if you want to be saved, you've got to believe Jesus is your personal Savior. But as of that moment, when he's not a believer and he's unregenerate and hell-bound, Jesus isn't his Savior. If he was his Savior, he'd be saved. You hear what I'm saying? As of this point, hell-bound, lost, ruined sinner, whom Jesus has not saved, who at this point does not believe Jesus is his Savior, is actually believing the truth. Duh. He's actually believing the truth. Nowhere in the New Testament did the apostles call upon men to believe Jesus as their personal Savior. But they do call upon men to believe He is the Lord, He is the Christ, He is risen from the dead, and He is the judge of all mankind. And when people believe that, then they show they believe that by submitting to the commandment of Him as Lord, Re believing all of his claims, repenting of their sins, believing and being baptized. And then after they do that, then the Bible comes along and tells them, you're a child of God. You're born of God. You're justified from all of your sins. Because now they had the evidence that they didn't have in their rebellion and unbelief. It is amazing that what passes for evangelism today in the religious world does not fit it as it is described in the book of Acts. I hope you got that. And if you didn't, you let me know and I'll say it again and again and again until you get it. So, what does a person need to believe to be baptized or in other words to become a disciple or a Christian? First of all, he must believe in God. I mean, the creation proclaims there is a God. Uh, if people can conclude that, they never saw a Bible in their life. Paul teaches that in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. For the invisible things of him are clearly seen from the creation, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead. Obviously, one of the requirements is to believe Jesus is the Son of God. Well, how can you believe Jesus is the Son of God if you don't believe there's a God for him to be the Son of? <laughs> That's pretty basic. We've got to start there. And Cornelius had that right. He knew there was a God and he feared him. And if anybody believes in God as the creation reveals him, then he understands that is a very powerful being out there, not one to be trifled with. I better fear him. So he must believe in God. And then he must believe in Jesus that there was this man named Jesus. And there was a reason why he was named Jesus. And that reason is given in Matthew 121. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means Jehovah saves. The very word Jesus defines him as a savior. You need to believe he's a savior. He's a Savior. That's what his name means. In fact, the Bible talks about it in Romans 3.26, that God is the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Do you believe God sent us a man in the world named Jesus for the express purpose of saving people? Do you believe that? 
I'm not asking you at this point if you believe He saved you. Do you just believe there's a Savior? And that if you are saved, He's going to have to do it. Jesus. The second thing is you must believe He is the Christ. And the unique thing about Him being the Christ is it was promised God would send someone in this world on a mission of salvation. And that person would be the Christ. The word Christ literally means the anointed. And God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and power to go about and do the things he did while he lived in this world. In Acts chapter 10, when Paul preached, or Peter rather, preached to Cornelius, this devout man that needed to learn the gospel to become a Christian, said he to him, in Acts 10.38, how God anointed Jesus. If he anointed him, that he is by definition the Christ. Anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Just look at his life. What did he do? He went about saving people. He saved people from demonic oppression, or satanic oppression. He saved people from sickness. He saved people from death. He saved people from all from hunger and from calamities and storms and drowning in them. All different kinds of things that Jesus did that just simply let us know this man has power to save. And he was sent to do precisely that. Look at John eleven twenty seven. I'm just going to give you a string of verses to show you what you need to believe in order to be baptized. In John eleven twenty seven, she saith unto him, this is Martha speaking to Jesus, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Look at John 17, 8. She believed that God sent Jesus. He was the promised one from the dawn of time that should come into the world. Do you know, and I have pointed this out to you before, that even the heathen in some of their poetry were living in expectation of someone to come and save? Even the heathen had some notion of that. Well, well, might they? Because that promise was made from the dawn of time that someone would come to rectify the mess engineered by the devil and the fall of man. <coughs> John 17, 8. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. See, that's what disciples do. That's what Christians do. They believe God sent Jesus. Look at verse 21. Or, uh, uh, just verse 28. That'll, uh, that'll be sufficient from this chapter. Or 25, rather. I'm sorry. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these, talking about the disciples, have known that thou hast sent me. Then look at uh, John chapter 3, verse 17. This thing of him being the Christ, one sent, and sent to save. As he will tell us in John three seventeen, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He was sent to save. John 4, 42. The Samaritan woman says, or rather the, uh, the Samaritans, when they heard Jesus preach, they said, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Then look at 1 John 4, 14. 1 John 4, 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. I ask you this morning, do you believe God sent Jesus? Do you believe there was a historical figure named Jesus of Nazareth that came here on a mission from God that's what's involved in him being the Christ. But there's more than that. Christ means the anointed. That word, the anointed, in the Old Testament was a synonym for a king. When you were made a king in Israel, you were anointed. 
So when you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're believing he's a king. You're believing he's the sovereign. He's the Lord. Acts 2, 36, the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, God hath made both Lord and Christ. And he's Lord of all. That's one thing that uh, Peter told Cornelius' household, that Jesus is Lord of all. That's why I sang this morning, crown him Lord of all. Do you believe he is the Christ, Son of God, the King, the Lord of all, with the power and mission to save? Primary mission to save. And then you must do as the eunuch and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And why is he the Son of God? And this is something that everybody that joins this church gets up here and confesses. He is the Son of God because He was born of the Virgin without a human father that God generated that child in the womb of the Virgin and for that reason He is called the Son of God. I would never baptize anybody that did not believe the Virgin birth or did not at least understand enough to know what that is. In Luke 1, 35, the angel answering Mary when she was trying to figure out, you're telling me I'm going to have a son and I've never known a man. How's that going to be? And then in Luke 1, 35, he says, the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. And therefore that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And then, believing that this Jesus who was sent from God to save, King and Lord of all, is the virgin-born Son of God, you then believe that in order to save, He died, as the Scriptures taught, was buried, and rose again from the dead. Lord and Christ, Lord of all. If you believe those things, that Jesus, the historical Jesus, is the one God sent, the Christ, come in the world to save, and that he is the virgin-born Son of God, a unique personage of all of history, uniquely begotten for his mission, the Son of God, and that he died on a cross for sinners, was buried and rose again, you believe enough to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, provided you also do this in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And by the way, and I must include this, the Bible teaches that this virgin-born Son of God would also be Emmanuel, God with us. You can't really believe Jesus is the Savior if you don't also believe He is God because the Scriptures are very clear there is no Savior but God. He said, I am a Savior and there is none beside me in the book of Isaiah chapter 43. I wouldn't baptize somebody that said, well, I think he was a good man but I don't believe he's God. Well, then you go somewhere else and get baptized, not here. But then there is this, in Acts chapter 2, 37 and 39, and I love this. I love this altar call, because it isn't the preacher asking the people, it's the people asking the preacher. <laughs> Big difference. In Acts 2, 37, now when they'd heard this, they were pricked in their heart. I mean, this one really got to them. They felt convicted. They were pricked in their heart. They didn't harden their heart against this and say, yeah, no, 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 I don't want to hear that. No, no, they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. There it is, Repent. Repent simply means to feel sorrow and regret for the wrongs and the sins of your past. And if you think about it, and I'm saying it's not difficult to become a Christian, 
It is not hard to know right from wrong. If your parents did their job, if you parents do your job, you are teaching your children the difference between right and wrong. And you learn that you're responsible to do right, and you learn that you suffer when you do wrong. If you taught your children that, you gave them the groundwork to prepare them to one day become a Christian. But parents that don't do that have sadly failed in their responsibility. And one of the things that I believe is engineered by the adversary of the gospel of Christ, who is Satan himself, is this permissive society of anything goes that indisposes people to basic gospel truth. People living in sin and don't even know it because nobody ever told them that is a sin. So, if as far as you understand right and wrong, and you repent of the wrong that you have done, and you believe these facts about Jesus Christ, that He's the virgin-born Son of God, sent from God, the Christ, to be a Savior, that died for sinners on His cross, was buried and rose again from the dead, and He's Lord of all. You believe that, and you regret the sins of your past, you are where you need, to, you are now ready. You're in a position that the command comes to you unequivocally, be baptized. Be baptized. Well, when should I do that? As soon as you can. When the Apostle Paul was met by Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road, and he for the first time realized that the Christ he was persecuting was everything he claimed to be. The promised Messiah. The Son of God. God manifest in the flesh. What a shock that must have been. He had been blaspheming that very name. He had been persecuting and consenting to the death of people that believed that and followed that. What a shock that must have been to him. But the prayer he uttered is a prayer that we should utter the rest of our life, day by day. When he was confronted with who Jesus Christ was, and he knew who he was, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I would ask you, is that prayer on your lips? And there is an answer. It's the same answer that those people got when they asked the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to become a child of God. If you truly from your heart believe these facts, if you truly from your heart are sorry for the sins of your life, you're already a child of God. Else you wouldn't even have that mindset disposition. I'm not telling you what to do to become a child of God. I am telling you what to do to become a Christian. And all the errors of your past, these things you regret, it's time now to put them behind you. It's time now to wash the slate clean and have a new beginning. Not in terms of the old man that you were, but in terms of Jesus Christ. And so Paul says to, or pardon me, Ananias says to Paul when Paul has come to that realization of who Jesus Christ is, he says in Acts 22, 16, Now why tarriest thou? Arise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now we know from the Bible that Baptism is a figure, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Baptism is not what washes away your sins. What washes away your sins is the blood of Christ. Baptism is the figure of what does it. The figure of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So you wash them away in a figure. But in one sense of the word, when you repent on your, of your sins and you turn your life around to live a life in obedience to God, you are, in a very real sense of the word, cleaning up your life as of that point. 
And what all of that stupid, ungodly stuff you did in the past, you leave that in the tub or the river, wherever you happen to have done it. I baptized pretty well in every kind of place where you can baptize except the ocean. Oh, wouldn't I love to baptize somebody in the ocean. I've not had the opportunity to do that yet. But I, I, I've done it in the Detroit River. I've done it in swimming pools. I've done it in ponds and in lakes. But never yet, never yet um, in the ocean. Maybe God will let me do that one day. Baptize somebody in the ocean. But anyway. So when you believe these things... And now, the command to you is, what are you waiting for? Why are you tarrying? Get up! Rise! And be baptized. Because the Bible says, now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And you don't have to understand everything. You don't have to understand all the ins and outs of soteriology, the theology of salvation. You don't have to understand all the ins and outs of eschatology and end time events. You don't have to have the book of Revelation figured out. No. Now, I think given the fact that there's so many different kinds of churches out there that claim to be Christian, you need to have some understanding of what we are here before you come in. Not that that's necessarily a requirement for baptism, but let's just face it, people. We don't want somebody that gets baptized in ignorance and in the middle of the service they start raising their hands and speaking in tongues. I don't think that would go over quite well. We don't want somebody saying, Pastor, I have a prayer request. Uh, uh, my uncle, my uncle uh, Joe is going to hell. I'm going to witness to him this Friday. Pray that he accepts Jesus so he can become a child of God. That prayer request would not fit very well in this church. So understand, given the wind of every doctrine, there's some things you want to have cleared out. But you know, truth known, truth known, those things aren't absolutely necessary to be validly baptized. I'll give you a story. When Hugh and Bob Collins joined this church, the things I've said today that you need to believe to be baptized, that's as much as they knew. That's what they knew. They got baptized. And I remember, and you know how your dad could play devil's advocate. You do know that, don't you? I'm sitting with this guy in my living room, a baptized member of my church, struggling to understand the doctrine of election and raising all the typical Arminian objections. <laughs> but you know what? I answered his questions, came through in flying colors, and remained a devout believer of that until the day of his death. Because you see, they had had a valid baptism. They qualified to be Christians by the basic requirement. So you don't have to understand everything. You don't have to know everything I know. Good God in heaven, I don't know it all. Like I said, it's a learning process. That's what discipleship is all about. And what you need to do is if you know the facts of Jesus Christ as I have outlined them to you and you believe those facts and you regret your sins, you need to act on the commandment. Now, act on what you know, be it ever so little. And then further learning will come after. And this is the reason, but yeah, but, but this might happen. You, you can think of all these obstacles in the way of your doing now what God tells you to do. Well, here's the children of Israel. I, I, this is the reason I read Joshua 3 this morning, to draw an illustration. Here are the children of Israel on the verge of crossing the River Jordan to enter in and take the land that God had promised to their fathers. All kinds of obstacles. Cities walled up to heaven. Giants, well-armed armies to do battle with. And to say nothing of the fact that the Jordan River was overflowing its banks. And so what does God say? God says to the priests with the Ark of the Covenant going before, He said, dip your feet in the Jordan. Now the, the river is still racing by, overflowing its banks. Nothing's happened yet. It hasn't dried up like it did after they put their feet in there. But it wasn't going to dry up till they put their feet in there like God said. God says, you dip your feet in Jordan. Yeah, but how can we get across? It's still, it's still raging. No, 
Just do what I said. Put your feet in the Jordan. I'll take care of the rest. And so no matter what obstacles you see ahead of you, get in the water and God will take care of the rest. And it is interesting that once they put their feet in there, the river dried up and they went over dry shod. And they went on to conquer the Canaanites and take possession of the land. And every single problem they encountered, God was there with them to take care of it. You see, when you take the yoke on you, by taking that first step, the Lord will be with you to take you the rest of the way. And then once you've done that, then there's more things that you will learn. Like to say, the edu- you, you've now en- you have now enrolled in class. This is one thing some of you don't like school. But let me tell you something. When you graduate from school, you are not done with school. You will be in school learning lessons for the rest of your life and some of them difficult ones. That's what discipleship is all about. Now you are registered and officially a part of the class. You are now a scholar enrolled and you will go on to learn more and that's why you come to church to listen to your preacher to teach you the more things. As Jesus said it in Matthew 28, 28, 19 and 20, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. But see, notice the teaching doesn't stop there. It keeps going. Teaching them, the baptized believers who were taught the basic truth of Jesus, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. And people, stay with it. Once you have confessed this faith, once you have taken that step, and you have become a disciple, hold what you have fast and don't let any one or anything in this world rip it away from you. As Jesus said to the church in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 25, the church of Thyatira, that which you have already, hold fast till I come. Look at Hebrews chapter 3, 14. For we are made partakers of Christ If we hold the beginning of our confidence, that first faith you confessed when you were baptized, steadfast to the end, never let go of who Jesus Christ is. Never let go of what Jesus Christ has done. Don't ever decline from that. Build on that and move forward. Don't you want to be a partaker of Christ? I mean, after all people, he's Lord of all. He's the king of all creation and of all the universe. Imagine being part of his privy council. Having access to his person. Immediate access. Part of his court. Part of his cabinet. What a privilege. What a privilege. Don't you want that? Don't you want to be a part of that? Then you hold fast your confidence the beginning of it, steadfast to the end. And then in First John chapter 2 and verse 24, Let that therefore abide in you, which you've heard from the beginning. Don't let it slip out. Don't forget what you confess. Don't forget what you believe. Don't decide, well, I don't know if that really is true. Let that therefore abide in you, which you've heard from the beginning. And if that which you've heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. You will be, you will have fellowship with Christ. You will have the presence of Christ with you. You will have His help in any and everything you will go through. And in fact, you will be a victor. In 1 John 4, 5, 4 and 5. 1 John 4, 4 and 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is a victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you want this world to take you over? With all of its confusion and wickedness and darkness. You want it to take you over? Or you want to take over it? 
You want to be overcome by it or you want to overcome it? You hold that faith you confessed when you became a Christian and you hold it fast and you don't let anything in this world pull it away from you. And in the end, you'll be found a victor and there will be awaiting you a victor's crown. Who is he that overcometh but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? And as you launch out on this journey, you have a promise. It is found in Deuteronomy chapter 31. Mr. Ramsbottom I talked about him last Sunday. He preached 13 days before he died. And this was his sermon. And many of his, in his congregation said it felt like a farewell sermon. And I heard it. And it sure did. And this is what he preached. In Deuteronomy 31, 6, Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God... He it is that doth go with thee. See, he's in that yoke with you. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And while that promise was made to Joshua, understood, it is quoted in Hebrews 13 and applied to Christians to baptize believers in churches. In Hebrews 13 and verse 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto thee. Whatever you can imagine you may experience going forward as a Christian, you just stay coarse. You just keep doing what the Lord tells you to do. And I can assure you on the authority of the Word of God, you will be helped, you will get through it, and you will be an overcomer even in death. The promise is to you. Fear not. I'll be with you. Isaiah 41.10 Fear thou not, for I'm with thee. Be not dismayed. Don't lose heart or lose courage. For I am thy God, I will strengthen thee. Oh, I love this. Yea, I will help thee. And yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And those of us that years ago took the cross, confessed Jesus, and got baptized, and became a disciple of Christ, and set that as the determining thing for the rest of our life, has found, indeed, it is true, in every trial and dark moment we've ever faced. He didn't fail us. He didn't forsake us. He helped us. And by that help of God, we continue to this day. So the Lord has promised, when you take that yoke, He'll be with you. And so my challenge to all of you about holding that fast I want you to turn to Matthew 10 and take this up as a challenge. To be a Christian no matter what. Whatever else you may have to let it go. You may have to let go. Be it a dream, be it a relationship, be it an occupation, whatever. You make sure this one thing. You be a Christian. You have been made a Christian. You stay a Christian. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus talking about His disciples, some of whom would face martyrdom and death itself for their faith, said to them, He said, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Boy, that sounds like a lovely welcome awaiting. Wolves! People out there that want to devour you alive. The world's still full of them, people. And he says, fear them not, which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. And speaking of many sparrows, are you noticing how many geese we have? We were passing flocks of them. The traffic was even stopped to let them by. 
We've got a geese problem in this in this state. Well, they, I don't know where they came from. I don't care. They can go back. All right. Fear ye not, therefore ye are more value than many sparrows, and many geese, I might say. Whosoever there shall for shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Don't be ashamed to own Jesus. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I'm come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace with a sword. I'm come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter-in-law against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household, and some of you have experienced that. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. You see, Jesus going before, you following after. That's discipleship by definition. That's being a Christian by definition. And he that findeth his life shall lose it. But he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. The way of discipleship is the way to live. To find life the best it can possibly be lived in this fallen world. Brendan, how long have I been here? 116. I'm going to conclude. I'm going a little longer. This isn't going to be a series. So, one other thing. I don't often go this long. I have gone longer. I've gone an hour and a half. I've gone two hours. Matt, I went through your file and I read something that you wrote to me about how you perceived me when you were young. And the way you perceived me was, first of all, I had a southern accent. You wondered how anybody would ever be able to understand that drippy southern accent that I think I soon purged myself of. Another thing you perceived when you were young was, when will this guy ever shut up? But needs to say, your opinion changed. I want to go to 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm not going to comment extensively other than to just say as a disciple you can claim this for your life you can claim this for your life after you were told in verse 5 of 1st Peter that God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble he tells you humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God whatever God sends your way if it's affliction if it's chastisement Whatever it is, a commandment that maybe you don't want to do, but he says do it, get out and humble yourself, submit. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. That is, when it ought to be done. Whenever you're down, don't chafe against it, rebel against it, humble yourself under it, because somewhere, somewhere, somewhere out there, God's going to lift you up. When the time is right, when the humbling experience has accomplished its purpose. Casting all your care upon Him. I told a man this week that talked about being worried about the future. I said, don't focus on the future. Focus on the one who holds the future in His hands. Casting all your care upon Him. All your worry and your fear. For He careth for you. Be sober. Be vigilant. Be on your lookout now. Because if you're a Christian, you can be sure this is coming. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And how do you resist him? Doing just what I told you to do this morning. Hold that faith you confessed originally. Hold it fast. Because he wants to grab that and take it away from you. And when, you, when he does that, and you collapse into unbelief, you are vulnerable to all of his lies and deceptions and temptations. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren which are in the world. I guarantee you there's nothing you face, there's nothing that tempts you, there's nothing you go through, but what? There's brethren out there that endure the same. But the God of all grace who had called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you've suffered a while. We will not suffer forever, brethren. There is a terminus. And after you've suffered a while. And let's face it. 
whenever we've suffered affliction for our holy religion, whenever the hand of God has visited tribulation upon us and we have endured it, holding fast our faith, isn't it a fact that we come out on the other side stronger than we did before we went in there? And this is exactly the promise. After you suffer a while, make you perfect. Those afflictions have a way of ironing out wrinkles and deficiencies in our faith. Make you perfect. Establish. Fix you. Stabilize you. Strengthen. And settle you. So that you're not tossed here and there, here and there by everything that comes across in the media and the news. You hear it and you know how to dismiss it and hold the faith. Establish. Strengthen. Settle you. Ah, what a good note to end on. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.